Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm very excited to be here with Dr. Sheila Silver, a sexologist who has a private practice in Portland, Oregon. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad to be here. Great. Um, so I'm going to give a little intro about you. Unfortunately, I didn't memorize it, so I'm going to read it. Um, Dr. Sheila Silver is a board-certified clinical sexologist with a private practice in Oregon. She's a trained sex counselor, group facilitator, workshop leader, professional speaker, and sex educator. She holds a doctorate in human sexuality from the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality and a master's degree in marriage, family, and child therapy. She has given talks on intimacy and Parkinson's for Parkinson's Foundation, Caregiver Summit, UC San Diego Health, and more. She recently spoke at the World Parkinson Congress on sexuality and intimacy for people with Parkinson's and their partners. And she'll be speaking at the Advent Health Parkinson's Outreach in March 2020 on enhancing relationships and intimacy with Parkinson's. So we are clearly in good hands, uh, which makes me excited to get started. Um, many of the questions I have for you today are questions that I have been getting over the past couple of years about sexuality, Parkinson's, intimacy, relationships, and that kind of thing. So I have a lot. Hopefully, we'll get through um, a whole bunch of them. Uh, but first of all, I'd love to start with what is a sexologist? Great question, because a lot of people don't know. Basically, a sexologist is anybody who has 300 hours of academic training. So it could be a researcher, it could be an educator, or it could be a clinician like myself. Some people who are sexologists have a degree in sexuality, so they have a master's or a doctoral degree like I do. Um, but you don't necessarily need that. So they could be working in different avenues, and um, you're not unless they say they have a master's or a doctorate, they probably have about 300 hours of academic training, which is way more than a lot of therapists, of course. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so how did you get into this work? Oh, great question. So I originally was just a regular psychotherapist for about 15 years and had a private practice and loved it. And then I went back to my, um, I went back to school and got my doctorate specifically in sexuality because I was really aware that in the counseling field, there's a lot of people who feel really uncomfortable talking about sexuality. And I thought I could make a contribution. Um, one of, ironically, one of my very first jobs out of college was working at a private Catholic high school teaching sexuality um, before I ever got my master's or doctoral training. And then at some point while I was um, working after my, I got my doctorate, um, someone here in Portland in the Parkinson's community called me and said, we'd love for you to talk about Parkinson's. And that was exciting and fun. And I've been doing that work for the last six or seven years. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. That's interesting. That's an yeah. interesting path. Yeah. Um, so what do you see as the role of sex in our lives? Well, I think that's a really fascinating and broad question because for some people, depending upon their age and their health and a million aspects of their lives, it can be, it can have play no role. It can play no part. And I really want to say to those folks, it's, that's totally fine and totally normal. Like it doesn't have to be something that every couple needs to be doing. For some people, it's something that just happens very periodically. And other people, it's a vital, important aspect to their life. What I think is important when, it, when we think about sexuality is thinking about it sort of in terms of physical intimacy. I think physical intimacy is something that definitely should be part of all of our lives. We're humans. We need touch from when we're born throughout our lifespan. And so my hope is that even couples who choose not to be sexual as they age or as they you know, struggle with health issues, specifically in this case, Parkinson's, that they continue to touch and be close physically in a variety of ways. I love that you said that because that is not what people are told, <laughs> you know, right? They're told yeah. if you're not doing, if you're not having sex, if you're not sexually, um, intimate with your partner, then, then you're somehow like missing the thing and really missing out on a major part of life. And like you said, there's a whole lot to sexual intimacy and um, being intimate with a partner that, that is not just the sex act. And I think for people with Parkinson's, you know, that's not always 
on the top of their mind and it's not always something they're interested in doing and they need to feel okay about that. So absolutely. And what often happens is that because we use physical intimacy as a way to convey that we're interested in sexuality, when Parkinson's patients are really not interested in being sexual anymore, then sometimes they sort of shut down all their physical intimacy so that they're not sending the wrong message. And so a lot of what I talk to my clients about is to not let that, to, to get on the same page and not let that just sort of completely fall by the wayside so that you're not sending mixed messages, but you can come up with some ways of connecting and talking and being close that's physically close and connecting without, and pleasurable, hopefully, without it necessarily being whatever traditionally maybe sex was for the two of you. Yeah, I think that that communication piece is critical, right? I mean, yeah. You, you stop because you don't want to give somebody the wrong message and then you give them a, a totally different message that you're trying to avoid. Um, so yeah, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can talk about some different ways to communicate and really, you know, make it a, an acceptable dinner table conversation that it's not this thing that we just can't talk about um, and that talking about it actually creates intimacy. So uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot of, of ways to uh, work around whatever people are feeling in, the, in certain periods of their stage of Parkinson's or really any part of life. Um, what are some of the facts related to sexual dysfunction with people who are living with Parkinson's? Well, certainly it's true that sort of typical Parkinson's symptoms like tremor, rigidity, you know, um, slowness of movement, those are all going to impact the, your ability to be sexual. Fatigue is a big one as well, that people just don't have the energy to kind of put forth what they think they need to be sexual. This comes back to what we were just talking about, whereas it, if you can expand your definition of what it means to be sexual, you might have enough energy for that, but it, you have to keep changing and evolving your definition. Um, but other things that affect um, Parkinson's patients related to sexuality are things like um, difficulty getting an erection or keeping an erection. For women, it's dryness and pain sometimes. But some of these symptoms are actually kind of go along with aging or women being postmenopausal. And so it's hard sometimes to really know, is it related to Parkinson's or is it just normal aging that they would be experiencing anyway? Right. And, and for the people experiencing it, it's, it's a problem no matter exactly. what. Um, yep. So yep. do, I mean, I guess it, it's not really an, uh, an important question. Does, d does it seem like people with Parkinson's have a higher incidence of sexual dysfunction or is it not really, it's not much bigger than in the regular aging population. It's just that um, they may have, um, symptoms that just make it more complicated or more difficult for them to sort of engage in the act. Right. I would say the latter is probably true, but I don't think they have more incidents necessarily, but some of the symptoms certainly get in the way. And so they're often more, um, it's more important for them to sort of look at how can I, can I be adjusting, for example, the time of day so that I'm in my on period with my medications rather than kind of doing it typically at bedtime when I'm tired or I'm not, you know, at my optimum in terms of my medications. So I think Parkinson's patients need to be more aware of when's their best time of day and trying to hit that time. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So one question that came to me that I thought was really interesting uh, was somebody talking about body image and mm. sexuality. And that is something that is, you know, sort of a universal truth, right? There's, that's Absolutely. something that lots of people are thinking about, whether you're 21 or 91. Right. Um, but they were just talking about it in the terms of, you know, yes, their, their body shakes or they're, they're slumped or um, they're not as confident in their own body as they used to be, maybe five years before, you know, when they didn't have Parkinson's. So uh, what are some tools that you give people to kind of work through some of those issues? And, and I suspect it's communication with partners, but what is, what are some practical things that people can do? Yeah, certainly having a conversation about that, some of those things and trying to get a sense from your partner, whether it even really matters to them. Um, some of them can be, you know, helped by 
managing what time of day, for example, that you're trying to even attempt to be sexual. Um, but some of it is that, you know, as we age, we feel more self-conscious just as humans, as beings. And so, you know, we don't have the same bodies that we had when we were in our 20s or 30s or 40s. And so there is a huge, you know, way in which that often impacts people's sexual confidence um, when it comes to sexuality. And so part of what I try to encourage people to really think about is, you know, you are more than just what your body looks like. You know, you as a lover is more than that. Like how present are you? How interested are you? How curious are you? How much do you know about your partner's body? How interested are you in learning what they really enjoy and noticing what their body really likes? And there's a lot more to being really present with your partner. And I think that's one of the ways that a lot of Parkinson's patients can sort of adjust their focus is not just how am I looking, am I shaking too much, you know, what's happening with me, um, but what's instead what's happening with my partner and how can I create more pleasure and fun for them. And I think that makes a huge difference. A lot of men who have erection issues end up getting really caught up with their body and what it's doing or not doing. And often, those men are so caught up with what their body's struggling with that they actually aren't as present with their partner. And so I think one of the biggest pieces of advice that I often give clients in my office is simply thinking of themselves as more than just however their body looks, whether they've put on weight or they you know, just are saggy or just don't look quite what they used to and instead really focus on their partner and knowing their partner better and trying to create more pleasure and connection with their partner. Right. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the most common Parkinson's non-motor problems related to sexuality? That's a great question. I mean, these are sometimes the most important issues that are really facing people with Parkinson's and depression is, is a really important one. Many Parkinson's patients are battling with depression and so it really affects their energy level, it affects their self-confidence, it affects their interest in really engaging in sexuality. And so they need to really just look at that along with their neurologist and see if there's some medications that would really help with that. Um, another issue is that facial masking. So a lot of times we communicate sexually by really nonverbal, subtle things. And Parkinson's patients often, because their face is a little more frozen, it's kind of hard to find out whether they're interested and for them to convey their interest. Um, and so sometimes you have to be communicating in a more explicit and direct sort of way when you didn't have to prior to Parkinson's kind of showing up on the scene. Um, cognitive changes, of course, is another big issue that impacts sexuality. Being distractible is another thing that Parkinson's patients, in, you know, really impacts um, their ability to be present and focused and really connected. And so it requires a lot of patience sometimes on the partner um, to realize that this isn't about them. It's, a, it's about the, the patient and what they're struggling with and to try to look past some of that so that you can connect in that way. Yeah, and I mean, that's it's so interesting, right? We just talked about how if you're feeling not great about your body, mm -hmm. um, then you have all of these different thoughts that might impact. It's subtle, right? Like you're, you're thinking of it, but if you add that subtlety of not feeling good in your body with potential facial masking, potential depression, like there's just this whole feeling that kind of would create, you know, uh, curious uh, questions from your care partner or your lover or, you know, and just really kind of get, it's easy for things to kind of go off the rails, I would think, if, if nothing's being talked about and um, it can go on and on and on. And before you know it, you've made up all these different stories about why we're not having sex and, and uh, is it me? And really that had nothing to do with it. So, um, yeah. And another big issue that I should mention is just role changes. You know, I mean, if you're a care partner and you're doing a lot of caregiving, that really impacts sexuality. You know, there's a way in which it, you stop being 
the two of you and you end up sort of one person's a patient and one person's more of a caregiver and there's nothing sexy about that. <laughs> so, you know, I really encourage clients to try to drop some of those roles if just for that, you know, period of time when they're trying to connect physically or sexually or sensually in some way and just be who they are and remember their connection and try to leave all of that caregiving and patient mentality out of the picture because it really makes a difference. Yeah. And impact. Actually, um, this speaks to a question I got that was very specific and, um, I'll just read the exact question. It, it's sort of, uh, this one is a specific question, but it is a combination of many similar questions. And this is from a Parkinson's care partner. Do you have suggestions for care partners who are having difficulties feeling sexual attraction to their spouse with Parkinson's? I love my spouse and feel affectionate and close to my spouse, but the caretaking tasks and the loss of cognitive abilities have diminished or eliminated my desire for sexual intimacy with him. I feel guilty and do not want to be hurtful, but it's a difficult situation. Yeah. I just feel the like, oh, like just this person loves their partner very, very, very much. Um, but all of those things sort of collide into this feeling of not being interested in it. And it's, this is, you know, she, this person's not saying whether their partner is interested, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, what do, what do, what do, what does that person do with that? Like, what do we do? And, and is it a fair conversation to have of, of I'm getting very mixed up in my roles and it's, tough for me to get move out and I love you and that doesn't have any impact on like, what do people do in that situation right and it, this person is not alone it's a question that I get a lot when I speak publicly and so I think that's one of the first things that I would want them to know is this is not an unusual situation and um, I have enormous understanding and compassion for that um, one of the things, I mean, I think you're right, just having a conversation with their partner could be appropriate, but I think something else for them to really understand is there's a lot we can do with our partner that actually doesn't require desire or arousal. Like just having some touch um, with each other, like even if it's one di directional, you know, like just you putting your hands along the person's body and helping them feel, or just some naked holding or sitting in the bath together or doing some things where you're still touching each other, but there's not an expectation or a requirement that there has to be arousal, there has to be a lot of desire, there has to be an orgasm, like leaving some of those benchmarks, if you will, out and just saying, I can be close to you because I love you and you're important to me and I care about you. And we're going to change what our physical intimacy looks like. And that's the nature of what is and needs to happen as a result of Parkinson's. But I think that is a good conversation to have with a partner. And um, I think as long as all physical intimacy doesn't come to a halt, that there's actually a lot of ways that couples can still be close and physically connected um, and um, not let it just completely go away. Yeah. And I think that a conversation like that would be very freeing, right? Mm -hmm. if, if it's discussed and said, um, like, here's, here's what I fear. I fear that if we move into that place of touching that you're going to expect that it goes somewhere else. And really what I want is closeness and I want to feel close and I want to be able to do that without worrying. And can, can we do that? Like, yeah. can we try that for a week? Yeah. We, we don't have to commit to that for the rest of our lives, but can, can we give that a try? Yeah. Um, I think that could be really freeing and they might connect when they never would have before because right. one person was just too scared to go there. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. Um, so we talked a little bit about, uh, sort of challenges getting an erection for, for males. Um, some people say that, uh, they, they're actually able to get an erection, but if they make any changes during sex, like change a position or something that goes away and that's sort of a new thing with Parkinson's, um, that they experienced. So what are some things that can happen there. I mean, my initial thing would be like, well, try to keep in the same position uh, just to know that like that's a, a thing that might uh, put things to a stop. But what are some things that they can do? 
So yeah, that they may learn that there's certain positions that work now better for them than other positions. And so they should potentially just stay with what they know works best. What inevitably happens with Parkinson's patients and all people is that at some point, for whatever reason, we get a cramp or something, we need to move, we need to shift, something needs to be different. And so I think developing flexibility in your sexual pattern and being able to go on to something else and come back to intercourse, if that's something that you want to do later, is perfectly fine. I think we often have a pretty linear way of thinking about sexuality of first we do this, and then we do this, and then we do this. And if something goes wrong in that line, then we sort of like, oh, I guess it's not going to work today. And we you know, kind of give up on the whole event. And so my strong invitation would be to sort of see it as sort of this buffet of nibbling off of diff the buffet of different things we like. I'd like a little bit of this and let's do a little bit of that. And now I'm kind of sick of that. And now I want a little bit of this. And so there's no particular order and there's no particular progression. And so if for as you're describing, somebody loses their erection, okay, we're gonna move on to something else at this moment. And in five minutes or 15 minutes or whenever, we're gonna come back to it if that's what we wanna do then. But to just swing with it, because that is, I think, being really an expert in sexuality as we age, is being able to know that so something's going to start hurting or something's going to be uncomfortable or something's just not going to work right. And so we've got to choose other things and not just give up on the whole event because it's not going perfectly. Right. Yeah. So what are some things that happen with women that make it uh, challenging for women to, to engage in intercourse? So certainly for women, um, dryness, and this could be because just postmenopausal, we as women, you know, are a little, a lot more dry, um, and pain can be associated with intercourse because of that. There's a thinning of the vaginal walls, and so sometimes women experience pain if they're not on any kind of supplemental hormonal um, medications, and so what I urge women and men to realize is that for sexuality for women is a lot about their clitoris and not so much about their vagina. Like some women really enjoy penetration with hands or a penis or whatever, but for a lot of women that that's not, that's emotionally connecting thing, but in terms of pleasure, it's not the end all or be all for them. And so a lot of women need to sort of explore what else can happen, what else might I enjoy that doesn't necessarily involve something that's penetrative, because if that's painful for them, then there's so many other things that they could do. And maybe up to this point, they haven't really explored that, but this is a good opportunity to sort of see, well, what other pleasure might I like? Um, what else could we be doing? What kind of massage of my clitoris might be really lovely? Maybe it wouldn't get them to orgasm and they need to use a vibrator at some point or whatever, but at least it would be fun and pleasurable and connecting and it's all sex. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to move a little bit to uh, issues revolving care partners. We get a lot of questions from them. So what are the most common sexual challenges for Parkinson's care partners? Well, I think this whole notion that I was speaking earlier in terms of their own fatigue, their own depression, they're feeling like they're a caretaker and not just a, an equal partner, that there's sort of more on their plate logistically, but there's also sort of this, their own worry, their own fear of watching their partner change over the years. All those things impact sexuality. And um, I really encourage care partners to do a lot of self-care. I know they hear a lot about that at care partner symposiums. And I think all of that is super important that they have some time, they get some breaks from caretaking depending upon you know, where the disease progression is for their partner. Some, for some couples, it's not an issue at all yet because they're kind of early on. Um, but for others who are later in later stages of of Parkinson's, it, it can be a real issue. And so I think it's just important that they give themselves some breaks and some time away from that role. And that they, when they're trying to be sensual or sexual with their partner, that they really unhook from that role and, and sort of say, I don't need to take care of them right now. If they need something, they're gonna speak up. 
I can just show up and ask for what I need and what I want. Um, something else I encourage care partners to do is to sort of watch their anger or resentment inside themselves. Sometimes it just kind of collects really slowly over time and they don't even realize that sort of that tank inside them is full. And so part of what I encourage care partners to think about is staying on top of that and finding places where they can kind of just let loose, whether it's exercising and going for, you know, a workout of some sort or talking to friends or talking to a therapist or journaling or whatever they need to do to just say, I've had a frustrating week, but I need to just try to let all of that go. Because I think if you don't, this is more of a marathon than a sprint. <laughs> and it, it's important to stay mindful of where they are emotionally with their partner. Yeah, I think, you know, in that case, I mean, all of those things you mentioned are really great. And also, you know, if they if they have the luxury and they have the accessibility to a Parkinson's care partner support group, um, you know, just being able to say, oh, yes, <laughs> I get that too. And I want this and I can't. And are you just really frustrated and upset. And um, that's really helpful. Uh, you know, people, it's tough. People with Parkinson's, they, they want to talk to each other too, because no one else gets it. And people, care partners are People with Parkinson's, no one really else gets it. Yeah. And so that's a, it's an important outlet for sure. Um, one question that I got that was interesting is, and I think this is sort of related to dyskinesia for people, but is sex ever dangerous? Because uh, if the partner gets, you know, their dyskinesia gets a lot worse, um, is, that, is that a problem? Yeah, it, I, when you talk about sex, are you talking about intercourse specifically in that question? I am. Okay. <laughs> Just want to be sure because I yeah. think of it super broad. I know. So, I, I, I believe I am thinking about that. The act. Okay. Yeah. So I think, I think the person's, I think the answer to your question is no, that someone's going to know before things get bad that they're, they need to stop or something doesn't feel right. It may feel, the dyskinesia may feel awkward and, you know, create difficulties, but I, I it's I, dangerous I don't think they need to be concerned about that. If they have heart issues or something like, you know, complicating, that's different. Um, but just Parkinson's patients in general, when, as it relates to intercourse, I don't think they need to worry about yeah. that. I think the question comes from the person has dyskinesia already, uh -huh. and then it gets a lot bigger yep. or, you know, more pronounced. And I, th I think they're, you know, it's, well, they're aroused. They're, they're in the middle of sex. So that's part of it. It's, it's not, if they're okay with it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. We talked about ways to reduce stress and to talk about it and to make sure that people are, you know, really connecting with, um, other people in their community. Um, this is a big question we get all the time. How can I improve my relationship with my partner when sexual intimacy is not something they or I want, uh, but, but we still want to be connected? Mm -hmm. Great question. And I don't, I'm not sure in that question if they don't want to be physically connected at all or they just don't want to be sexual Sexually. in the way that they used yes. to. Yeah. So I'll, there's sort of two answers to that. One is in terms of just generally staying physically connected, I, I, said, I think I said this earlier, you know, remembering to have some naked time that's not going anywhere other than just you're laying there together enjoying each other's bodies or you're rubbing some lotion or some oil into each other's bodies just for relaxation and feeling connected and because you are more intimate with this person than anybody else on the planet. And so it's, it's really, it's just enjoyable to be close that way or kissing or holding hands or sitting close to someone. Sometimes people like having really just still hands on their body as opposed to moving hands, that there's some fear that if your hand's moving, I don't quite know where it's going to go. And so they don't really uh, feel comfortable or um, having moving hands on their body, but just a hand on the face or a hand on the chest or just your, your hands either side of your, your shoulders or your arms can feel really lovely. And I always encourage people to do like spooning or cuddling in bed. So those kinds of ways 
and being on the same page and realizing this isn't a lead up to anything else. I just want to make sure that we're doing this. So that's sort of in the physical intimacy realm. Now, I think it's important to pay attention to sort of your relationship as you age. Long-term relationships need tending. Um, and so other ways to stay pretty close and connected are, is to have deeper conversations. Sometimes Parkinson's patients are talking a lot about logistics, about appointments or treatment or food or sleep or, you know, a variety of things, or it's grandchildren or it's, you know, work or house stuff. And so all of the conversation is about that kind of stuff. And there isn't that deeper connecting of how are you really, you know, like heart sharing of what would be a fun vacation we could take, you know, sometime in the next year, or those deeper conversations. So I actually have a heart share list um, that I'd be happy to share with people where it just sort of prompts you of what other things could we be talking about that would make us feel close and connected to each other other than sort of the day-to-day -day stuff or health stuff. So that's certainly one, um, one thing that I think is really valuable. Something else that I think is really valuable is appreciations. That there's a way in which, yes, our partner knows we love them. Our partner knows that we appreciate them making dinner for us or bringing us coffee or whatever, but not letting any of those things sort of go by the wayside, but just making sure that we're saying, thank you for doing that. I, I love when you do that. I love when you open the car door for me, or I love when you pick up my sweater when I drop it on the ground, or just whatever it is, whether it's specific appreciations or it's just general things like, I just love being married to you. I love waking up in the morning with you. I'm so glad we're married. Like those may sound corny, but they are really lovely ways for couples to connect. And I, my experience with a lot of couples in my practice is that it is those people who articulate that kind of stuff to their partner that they end up feeling really close and connected, even though they don't want to be physically sexual or sensual anymore with their partner. There's a bond and a closeness that's invaluable, really. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that. I love, um, and the examples that you gave were, you know, sit, being grateful for something that had nothing to do with Parkinson's, right? So yes. it wasn't, thank you for, you know, helping me put my clothes on, you right. know, because it's just, you know, un, unrelated to that, to remind people to connect. It's fine, of course it's great to be grateful for those things as well, but um, to have that time to just be grateful for, um, I would choose you every single day. This is, this whether this is here or not. Yeah, I think exactly. that's great. And I love the idea of the heart share and I, I really definitely wanna share that with our community because that can be something they sit down to dinner and every night for 10 minutes, they just yep. connect on a question. And uh, that goes a really long way. And um, it's the, you know, it's, it's the compounding factor of all of those communications totally. that really can, can transform something um, in a short amount of time. Yeah, the other thing I really wanna add here too, which I think is particularly important in this day and age is to be aware and mindful of technology and how it invades our couple time. Whether it's the TV's on in the background or the radio's on or somebody's on their phone or somebody's on the computer or their iPad or whatever it is, that it's, I think it's really important for couples to have some time together when none of that is happening. Like the TV isn't on, there isn't anything going on in the background. We're just with each other, looking into each other's eyes, having a really good discussion or laughing our heads off or playing a game. I think just having fun together and making sure that it isn't um, technology invaded, if you will, because technology can be so distracting, particularly because we get notifications or things go ding or whatever, you know, like it can, impact, I think, the quality of the connection. So I think it's important to just point that out and let people think about, yeah, do we always have dinner? And we talk during dinner, but the back in the background is the TV. And maybe we could turn that off. Maybe that would really make a difference in how we connect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's see. What is the giver-receiver exercise? Oh, I love that. Yeah. So 
That is um, kind of an activity that I often give to a lot of my couples to kind of, it's a multi, (laughs) it it has multi aspects to it that really offer a lot for couples. So basically what it is, is for, it can be as short as five or 10 minutes or longer where one person is giving touch to the other person, but the kind of touch that's being given is what the receiver asks for. It isn't what the giver wants to give or thinks that person would like or any of that. The giver doesn't decide what the touch is. The receiver is the one who asks, maybe at the beginning of the five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever, what they want, or it may be a moment to moment every few minutes. Okay, now I want you to do this. Okay, now I want you to just run your hands along my body in a really slow way. Giving the the giver some coaching as they do it so that you're getting the touch that you want exactly the way you want it. And one of the benefits of that is that the giver ends up learning a lot about what the receiver really likes. We often give touch in the way that we want, not necessarily in the way our partner wants. And so one of the values of this exercise is that if the receiver is saying exactly how slowly the hands should move, or I want you to not move your hands at all, I just want you to lay them on my back, then the giver ends up learning a lot about, wow, this person really likes light touch, or they really like this, or they really like that. And it can be as simple as just non-sexual touching, or it could be more sexual, depending upon what the couple wants. But the value there is that the receiver is having to speak what they want and communicate in that way. And if they don't know what they want, it's totally fine to say, why don't you just start by doing such and such? I don't know if I'm going to like it or not, but just start that, that way. And that starts getting the receiver to start learning about what they like and how they like it and trying out different things if they don't already know. And it allows the giver to start learning more specifically and accurately what that receiver likes. And then you switch after 10 minutes or 15 minutes or however long you've been doing that. It's great. Right. So, and also, I mean, I think for the receiver, it's how, how, how can I learn to accept this? This is gonna translate into a lot of areas of my life. I'm asking for something. Am I open to receiving it? Am I accepting it? Do I feel worthy of it? All of those things right. that transfers later when you can't walk to the car or you know you need help in another way. This is how I could you need you to help me. Um, it's really just a communication tool, right? That's exactly. gonna help exactly. them in lots of different ways. What's nice so what about, are some, oh, let me just say one more thing. What's nice about it is because there's just one way touch, sometimes when we're touching and, and our partner's touching us all at the same time, it's hard to really sort of enjoy touching and it's hard to really enjoy the receiving. So it sort of pulls those two things apart so that the person who's receiving can just relax into receiving and the person who's touching can just focus on that person. And so it's kind of nice to pull those apart sometimes so that touch isn't happening simultaneously and you don't get to sort of fully enjoy either part. I just had a vision of, you know, the lines of people in the back, scratch, like oh, everyone right. behind you and you're like, this isn't really fun because I'm having to do work. And then, well, you know, I like can't I can't really get into it. what's happening. Right. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, so you've been doing this a really long time and you've asked your clients and stuff to do that. What are some of the things that they've come back to you and said, wow, this really did what? You know, what were some of the benefits that, that people are getting from that? People love this exercise. I hear that again and again and again. And um, some of the reasons they love it is what I just, some of what I just said is they start learning more about their partner. They start learning more about their own bodies. They start expanding the kinds of things that they, kinds of touch that they would like their partner to do. Um, It also, for some people, provides an opportunity of, okay, you and I are gonna do the giver receiver exercise tonight after dinner. So I'm already thinking about what I might ask and I'm kind of getting ready for, oh, if I want you to rub oil into my body, then I have to be in a place where I'm even ready to take my clothes off and do that. So it 
really forces people to create some, what I call bridging time, like time to kind of get ready to be intimate. And I think for a lot of people, particularly women, we need that. We need sort of a period of time when we can sort of stop our regular life and our responsibilities and sort of all those things that pull at us. And we can just say, okay, here's some time for me to just be with my partner and just there's no agenda. There's no have dos. There's no responsibilities here. I'm just going to connect with them and enjoy being touched by them and touching their body. And so part of what the giver receiver exercise does is it kind of allows women and men to sort of say, okay, what do I need to do to be ready for that time that we're going to spend this evening or this afternoon? And so that preparation time um, is sometimes really helpful for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So, what do you? What makes it so difficult to talk about sex? What What is what's what gets in the way for people? Well, I think there's just no experience with it, and we have no modeling. Like we we see movies, and they don't have long, deep, hard conversations about sexuality. It just sort of magically happens, and somehow both people know exactly what to do to the other person, and so. I think there's this myth out there that we just are somehow supposed to know what to do with our partner and be super skillful without any conversation. And many of us grew up in homes where sexuality was not talked about. I certainly did. And so there's just no experience with that. And it just feels uncomfortable and awkward. And for some people, they sort of feel like, oh, it kind of ruins it if we have to talk about it. So I want it to be mysterious and just sort of naturally, spontaneously happen. And, you know, it just doesn't really work that way. My experience is that couples who have really good sex actually talk about it and they talk about it beforehand. Like, you know, what I think I would like us to do tonight is blah, blah, blah. And then there's a little bit of communication and feedback while they're being sexual. And then sometimes there's some debriefing afterwards or the next day of, you know, that thing that you did, I really liked that. It felt really good. Or that was kind of confusing. Did you like that? Or didn't you like that? Like, I think all of that is important. And we do that naturally for so many other things in our life. Like everybody already has all those skills about talking some, about something ahead of time, whether it's going to play tennis or playing soccer or going out for a meal, we talk about what we might order and then we talk during the middle of it of, oh, this salad dressing is so <laughs> delicious or whatever. And then on the way home, we're like, oh, that dessert was so great. You know I mean? Like there's, there's ways in which we reminisce and we talk about things and we're like, I'm never ordering that again or whatever. And so I think sexuality shouldn't really be any different, but we just don't have any experience with it. And we have an expectation that it shouldn't be like that, I think. And so I love telling people, no, I think the expectation is we totally need to talk about it and it's going to go better as a result of it. And when we reminisce, and I think one of the most beautiful questions that people can ask their partners sometimes is, you know, what was, if you were sexual or sensual with your partner, let's say last night, the next day saying, tell me your favorite part of that experience. And sometimes it can be really surprising. It can be something that you wouldn't, you may anticipate what you think they're gonna say and then they say something really different. Like when you rolled away from me, your hair fell like this and it was so beautiful. I remember looking at your arms and it was just like, oh, you're so gorgeous. Or, and that may not be what you thought they were gonna say. So sometimes you can hear some really lovely things from your partner if you're willing to ask that question about what was your favorite moment or what yeah, is something you would like to do differently next time yeah. or I wanted to ask for something but I was embarrassed to ask for it and I thought you might think it was weird so I didn't ask for it but next time I really want you to do whatever and so I think it's a chance to be have some brave conversations and really be that's intimacy is really wow. having those conversations yeah so um to get super practical, let, let's pretend that you have seen somebody with Parkinson's or a care partner to somebody mm -hmm. with Parkinson's and they haven't started the conversation mm -hmm. around sex. 
but it's like this elephant in the room that's not discussed and the, the person that comes to you wants to initiate the conversation. What do you suggest? What are some scripts that people can, and let's assume that the person is, you know, they know their, their partner's gonna be relatively open to this. Uh, they're safe with their partner. They just don't know how to start it. What, what's something that they can say? Well, I have um, some questions, some sort of conversation starter questions that I could certainly offer to people because I think, you know, there are, you know, some questions that, you know, might be helpful as a way of starting. If they're in my office, I probably might start differently than they might on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think one thing, one way to start is just sort of where are you at right now? What, like, what are you missing something? Is it totally fine where we are? You know, what is changing for you? What are you noticing about your own body that's different? You know, I think bringing some your, of your own vulnerability to the conversation and just saying, I'm noticing that I want to be close to you, but I'm not as interested in the intercourse as I used to be. And so I'm wondering, it, are there other things we could be doing? And, you know, just sort of, there's lots of, there's not a right way per se to start, but I think starting with not blame or complaints, but sort of starting with some vulnerability and starting with what you're noticing and what you're wanting about your own body and asking them of what are, what are you wanting? What are you wanting different? What could we do that might be lovely? but might be changed for us. And, and that's part of what has to happen is as people age, we have to adjust and evolve our sexual pattern. It's not gonna stay the same. And so it's sort of starting that conversation. Great. Did that answer so, your question? Yeah, no, that's great. I just, you know, sometimes I just want people to be able to walk away and be like, I'm gonna have that conversation tonight. I'm just gonna give it a try. And I really love the way it's just like, how is it feeling? Where, where are you? Yeah. What, you know, I'm feeling such and such you know, wondering where you are. I think, I think that's yeah. right. And so what's maybe one thing that we, I would like us to do differently is X or Y or Z, you know, mm-hmm. something really small and super specific. Mm-hmm. Like I'd like us to go to bed earlier so that yeah. I'm not so tired, or I'd like us to try to be sexual, you know, before dinner or in the afternoon when I have a lot more energy, you know, so it might be something really simple. Yeah. 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 So you have given so many talks and so many people have asked you questions. Is there a aha that people in your audience get a question that I haven't asked that I should have asked anything that you want to touch on that I haven't addressed yet? Well, there's two things that come to mind when you ask me that one is that I think people often feel really inspired and hopeful after they've come to one of my talks because they realize a that they're super normal in terms of what most people are experiencing and that that whatever struggles that they're having sexually may not necessarily be directly related to parkinson's they might be struggles that they would be having anyway and so i think that's part of what people often come away with is just a sense of oh, this is sort of normal that, you know, erections are difficult or fatigue is happens or desire changes or sort of all these really normal things that happen. And so what we need to do is just have a conversation about how do we adjust our pattern in a way that serves us and meets what we want. The difficulty is when you're kind of far apart in what you want. And for those couples, I think working with some sort of sex therapist can be super helpful to kind of mediate that conversation. But often couples aren't that far apart and they just need to have that conversation at home of, hey, how have we let things kind of go away and what would work for us now in terms of helping us stay close and connected? Yeah, that's great. Uh, So where can people learn more about you and your work and everything that you're doing? So uh, I have a website that's drsheilasilver.com, D-R-S-H-E-I-L-A-S-I-L-V-E-R.com. So you can certainly look at my website. Um, You could also go to the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. They have people on that website in whatever state you might live 
that um, could potentially help you begin some of these conversations if you feel like you need a little help and support. So that is um, a good resource. Um, there's also some great books out there, not specifically related to Parkinson's and sexuality, but are just good for sort of aging um, sexuality and, and adjusting our sexual pattern and broadening the way we think about them. Um, think about sexuality. And one of them is called Sexual Intelligence by Marty Klein, which I think is a fantastic book. Um, and the other one is Naked at Our Age by Joan Price. Um, both of those books really kind of reinforce what I've been talking about today, about really sort of looking at how all of us, as we age, need to sort of adapt the way we think about ourselves and um, our sexuality. And so those would be good resources. And I'm happy if people have you know, questions after we're done for them to email me. Um, I, I wanna be a resource for people in the Parkinson's community. Oh, so I'm great. happy to answer anything that people might wanna throw at me specifically. That's totally fine. Oh, that's great. That's very generous of you. I will, yeah. I will definitely put your link uh, to your website on our show notes and the books that you recommended. Um, and I will keep track of the questions that we get. Um, this has been super fun. I hope that we have a chance to talk more about it and Great. you have a chance to work with us more because it's really been delightful to, to talk to you about this. Thanks, Mel. It's been great. It's been really fun. Thank you.